Hey everyone, I'm back with another build log of the DIY Weissen lamp. If you're new here, this is a series where I try to make my own open source version of this expensive Dyson task light using 3D printing and off the shelf parts. It's been a while since I've posted an update and that's because I've been working on two problems that have proven to be pretty tough. The first of those is wiring, which on this project means finding a way to route power and data from the base of the lamp all the way out to the end of the horizontal arm and to the LED. The second is finalizing the components used to power and control the LED, and then finding a place to put those parts on the lamp. These two problems have been really tricky on their own, and they're also really dependent on each other. So while I've been working on them in parallel, I'm only going to cover wiring in this video. And then next, I'll cover electronics in a separate video. The challenge of routing and hiding wires in this lamp is better understood if we spend some time gawking at the original Dyson design. Within this super minimalist form factor, there is somehow cables running from the base into the vertical support, which rotates 360 degrees over the top of the vertical axis, down into the carriage, which moves up and down, into the horizontal arm, which moves forward and back, and from there into the LED fixture. All of that is almost completely invisible. Scrolling through the product page on their website, you'll find praise for intelligent daylight adjustment features, appreciation for the LED's efficiency, and recognition of the elegant motion system, but you won't find a single acknowledgement of just how cool and sweet it is that they managed to hide all the wires. I said in my first video in this series that one of the reasons I'm doing all of this is to better understand this lamp that for some reason I have a lot of appreciation for. And so far, this unassuming problem of routing hidden wires has been especially illuminating. I didn't know this when I started, but I can say with certainty now that the best feature of the Dyson light cycle isn't the LED cooling or the daylight tracking or the three axis glide. It's this, the wiring, a feature that is completely uncelebrated and almost totally invisible. They pulled this off so well that for a long time, I wasn't even sure that I could replicate it. And even if I could, I wasn't sure that I could do it legally. That's because Dyson, despite what their marketing might lead you to believe, knows that this is their best feature or at least their most novel and novel features get patented. Let's look at Dyson's patent for this and see how they pulled it off. It breaks down into two basic solutions. One, getting power from the source at the base of the lamp up to the carriage, and two, getting power from the carriage out to the LED. This latter solution involves a pair of magnetic connectors, one which is mounted to the carriage and one which is mounted to the horizontal arm. The one that's mounted to the horizontal arm is special though because it can glide back and forth along the arm as it moves back and forth. This document says that there's some flat cable hidden inside of the arm, but it doesn't really get into the details of how it moves around or where it's connected. Whatever it is, it's really cleverly hidden within the rail. Also clever is how power is supplied to the carriage in the first place. To illustrate this, I found a different Dyson patent, which has been abandoned, but has a really helpful cross-section view. Figure 7C and 7D illustrate the dual role of the belt that connects the carriage and the counterweight as both a structural connection and also as a power cable. While the DI Weissen has just a simple belt that connects the carriage and the counterweight, the Dyson belt doubles as a power cable. This flat cable runs from the power source in the lamp's base, up the vertical arm, down to a first pulley attached to the top of the counterweight, and from there makes its way up the exterior of the vertical arm, around the top of the pulley, and finally connects to the carriage at the electrical connector we saw in the earlier patent. If you look closely, you can actually see the electrical wires that are embedded in this belt uh, underneath the surface here. The fact that they're documented in this patent means that even if I had the knowledge and the means and the materials to technically recreate the solution, which I don't, legally I can't replicate this design and I definitely can't make a video series explaining exactly how I did it. So I need a different approach. And while I don't think I can make the wiring as discreet as Dyson has, I think I can get pretty close. My biggest asset right now is that there are these channels within the aluminum rails, which might be just enough space to let me hide some cables. Hiding a static cable in these channels is actually quite easy, but when you move the arm back and forth, it highlights the difficulty of hiding a dynamic cable, which is what Dyson has done so well. With the distance between the carriage and the arm constantly changing, the cable has a tendency to flop over, bunch up, and otherwise interfere with the moving parts of the lamp. What I need is a way to route wires from one end of the axis to the other, kind of loop back around on itself and connect to the carriage, all without twisting, tangling, or otherwise clogging up the wheels, especially in extreme positions like when the lamp is very low vertically or the arm is pushed all the way back. And I need that solution to also keep the cables looking tidy and submerged within the channel. 
At first I thought some extra support from basic cable sleeving might do the trick, but this isn't enough to alleviate the sagging from side to side that I'm seeing, and I couldn't find any small enough to even fit inside of the channels. A flat cable also seemed promising because they only tend to bend in one direction and they're super slim, super tidy looking. But the narrowest one that I could find is just a millimeter or so too wide to fit in the channel. And it also doesn't come in black, so that's kind of a deal breaker for me. It seems like I won't be able to find a solution for managing these cables off the shelf, so I'll have to make my own. If you're into 3D printing or CNC routing, then you've likely come across this awesome invention called a drag chain. They're usually used as a form of strain relief and organization, a way to organize a bunch of cables that would normally get flung around into a tangled mess. They're super popular and useful, so you can usually just buy them off the shelf in the specification that you're looking for, uh, but going with the theme of this video, I couldn't find one that was narrow enough to fit within the channels of the rails. So I'm 3D printing my own. Uh, I'm using a heavily modified version of this fully parametric drag chain design uh, that's made by Gasolin over on Printables. And this is a really nice design because you can edit many of the parameters in SCAD. It will generate a new 3D printable model and you can print it. For this use case, I had to pull it out of SCAD and do a little bit of extra custom tweaking in Fusion 360 in order to make the cable fit through the cavity. I'm pretty new to drag chains, so I decided to print two variants, one with six millimeter links and one with 12 millimeter links, just to see which one works best for this use case. I, I really have no idea. I printed them out using a small 0.25 millimeter nozzle just to make sure I could get those extra details. And I assembled them into what seemed like a pretty convincing drag chain. And most importantly, it fits perfectly within the channel of the aluminum rail. I need to figure out a way to connect the drag chains where they are meant to intersect at the carriage. And I have some flexibility here, but the main constraint that I'm going to be thinking about is that the end of the drag chain has to be in perfect alignment with its corresponding channel where the rest of the cable is sitting. That way, it's more likely to fall right into the channel when it's not in use. And I have a two-part solution for doing this. Part one is a final link in the chain that simply connects the carriage and the drag chain using a couple of screws. And that is connected to the second part of the solution, which is a special penultimate link that allows the cable to safely exit the chain before it gets cut off by the screws of the final link. I'll hold all this in place with some threaded inserts that are inserted on the opposite side of the carriage. And once the lamp is finally assembled, they'll be hidden by the rails. Seeing the drag chains in place and fully assembled, I think the concept is working pretty well, but I need to fix the routing of this cable because as it's crossing from one side of the carriage to the other, you can see that it's rubbing up against one of the wheels and I really can't have that. What I need is some way to hold this cable so that it's clear of this back wheel. Uh, the problem is that I really like the current design of the carriage and I don't wanna add anything like an additional clip that is going to change the overall shape. I thought about this for a bit and instead of adding an extra part, I think what I'll do is replace one of these aluminum spacer with a custom 3D printed one that has an integrated path for the cable to run through, keeping it clear of that wheel. And one thing I wanna point out here that applies both to this custom spacer, but also the chain link clips that I just talked about is I recognize that I could model these in directly to the carriage um, and save a little bit of hardware. But for a long time, I've had this fantasy of someday seeing seeing this carriage out of aluminum and keeping these parts independent and not integrating them into the carriage itself keeps that alive and means it'll be easier someday to uh, cnc this carriage so that's why i'm doing it this spacer works really well uh, it routes the cable perfectly and the really nice thing about this solution is if i need to make small adjustments i can rotate this spacer a little bit and it uh, contorts the cable in a slightly different way and can help me get out of any future situations where i just need to route the cable slightly differently with that basic proof of concept tested, I just wanted to do one more round of refinement. I'm reprinting both drag chains with that smaller six millimeter variant. And this time I'm using a print in place method, which means I can print 16 fully assembled links all together all at once. And this means that I don't have to sit there for an hour assembling the drag chains, which is really nice. And more importantly, it also eliminated some of the deformation that I was seeing uh, on each individual clip, which arose from that process. So this is much cleaner. It's gonna look a lot better. With the newer, better drag chains on the lamp, you can get a feel for how they're going to work in practice. And looking at this overall, I'm not exactly over the moon excited with this solution compared to the original, but considering the technical and legal constraints, I'm actually pretty happy with this. 
The drag chain keeps the cable orderly, and while it's a little untidy in extreme circumstances like where the arm is very low and pushed all the way backward, the more common position will look more like this where the arm is in the upper quarter of the vertical axis and it's fully extended. And when it's like this, I actually really like the way that this looks. It's very clean. To finish up the wiring, I'll need to terminate it at the base and also up here at the LED. Speaking of that LED area, um, that's going to be severely affected by the decisions that I made in this video. Originally, I had planned to house the LED driver, the LED controller, and the power converter down in the base where there's lots of room. Um, and then I would just run the necessary three data wires and two power wires from there up to the LED housing. But with this tiny drag chain, I'm not gonna be able to squeeze even a small five conductor cable all the way through this, uh, which means that I'm moving the brains of the lamp from down in the base up here where the LED is. That means that the cables running up through the drag chain will just carry power and that fits just fine. And then all the electrical components need to be housed in this tiny area just around the LED. So we'll see how that goes in the next video. I'm already dipping my toe into areas that I've never explored before and it's quite challenging, but really fun. I'm excited to share it with you. Yeah, and then from there, I'm not really sure what's left to do on the DIY sin. I think I'll be able to finish up version one of this project in the next two videos or so. I plan to release a final short video summarizing the entire project and the final design. And I have some big surprises planned for that video actually. So anyone who's wanting to build their own DIY sin, uh, you'll want to stick around for that. And yeah, until then, thank you all for watching and thank you especially to my 60 subscribers. I can't believe I have 60 subscribers. That's so cool. Uh, I really appreciate you guys for tuning into the project and talking to me about it, leaving comments and stuff. So thank you, it means a lot to me. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks a lot, see ya.